Hey, Supernova here. I'm an atheist who's going through How Do We Know the Bible is True, Volume 1, edited by Ken Ham and Bodie Hodge, put out by Answers in Genesis, and written by a variety of authors. Now, today we're on to Chapter 5, is Genesis, a Derivation from Ancient Myths. It's written by Steve Ham, who, according to the bibliography in this book, is a, a member of Answers in Genesis, a speaker, and a co-author of a couple books, and also... Ken Ham's little brother, although strangely it's not found in the bibliography of this book. I had to Google that. You might have guessed it from his last name. Now before I get into the actual content of this chapter, I'd like to have a, a little discussion about the logic of this argument because, you know, I'm a rational guy and I, I love discussing logic. Now, uh, it seems like this chapter was written in response to atheist arguments being made that the Noah's Flood myth is drawn from the Epic of Gilgamesh, a very well-known Sumerian flood myth. And uh, there's a lot in common between the two of them, and the Sumerian flood myth is older, so it would seem to have inspired this very similar uh, Noah's flood myth. But all we have is the, the things that they have in common, the correlation. We don't have any evidence that one caused the other. And you might be able to tell from my wording, if you've ever heard of the logical fallacy, correlation does not imply causation. That's, that's the direction I'm taking here. Just because they have a lot in common and one follows the other doesn't mean that one caused the other. Now, if the author actually wanted to take a look at the logic, if he understood logic, then he could have made this case and said, no, atheist, this is not necessarily true because we know that you're making a logical fallacy if you do that. But of course he doesn't understand logic, and this is going to show very much when we get to the actual content. Now, uh, just because one follows the other doesn't mean that it caused the other. There are four different alternatives here. Number one is the one that, that atheists would imply, that uh, the, the writer of the Noah's Flood myth had read or heard the Sumerian myth and therefore incorporated it into his own uh, texts and therefore it was derived from the myth. And that would make the Bible untrue, even though we already have good reason to believe that it's not. It would it would prove conclusively that the flood myth was not based on fact or reality. It was instead taken from somebody else's story that is believed to be untrue. At least the Christians would believe that to be untrue. Uh, so of course that's why atheists like that, that alternative. But remember, there are three other options. Number two is that the Sumerian myth was actually drawn from the Noah's Flood myth. Now you may say, no, no, the Sumerian myth is older. Well, as far as we know, as far as we have evidence for, it's entirely possible that uh, because the Sumerians discovered written language long before the Hebrews did, that they simply put theirs in writing first. It could have been an oral tradition among the Hebrews, and the Sumerians just happened to hear that and then wrote it first. So it, it's possible that the direction of causation goes the other way. I find that extremely unlikely, and even though it's the weakest of the four alternatives, that's the one that uh, Steve Hamm is going to explore in this chapter. Go figure. It's the most illogical, but it's the one he likes. The third alternative is that there is no correlation. We don't have to prove causation because there isn't a correlation. Now, consider this. We, we have something natural to us known as confirmation bias, where when we get a theory, we only see the evidence that supports our side and we ignore the parts that don't. There are differences between the stories, and maybe we're just ignoring uh the, the parts that are different and only focusing on the parts that are similar. Now, that seems to be uh, very unlikely, too, because there are a lot of things that are just too too wacky to for people to just make up all on their own. There are things that don't really have to do with floods, such as uh, both the, the Sumerian king and the, the Hebrew Noah sending out a raven and a dove to check if uh, the flood had stopped. That's that's such a, a weird thing to do, and it, it seems like something you'd only find if both of these correlated. So a logical possibility, even though not a, a likely one. And it's also possible that they're not uh, correlated because they just might have both happened to be true. Now, that's also logically possible, 
but it's scientifically impossible for either of them to be true. But anyway, I'm just throwing it out there. And then the last uh, option is that they both derive from the same source. Now, this is the one that I prefer. I'm, I'm backing this one up because there is some good evidence for this. There's not just these two myths. There's a Hindu flood myth. There's an Australian Aboriginal flood myth. There's a Greek flood myth. You can look these all up on Wikipedia. I did. And uh, so we see that, that there are a lot of independent flood myths, or not necessarily independent, but there, there's just such a wide range of them from so many different cultures that it would seem that this is just a, a common theme and perhaps drawn from something that actually happened in history. We know from archaeological evidence that the Black Sea flooded at, in about uh, 5600 BC, which would be uh, roughly about this time, uh, just before both of the flood myths that we're discussing here. And so maybe they both have a shred of truth. They're actually derived from something that happened and they just both got distorted. Uh, and But there's actually a lot of good evidence, too, that this flooding was just gradual. We don't really know for a fact that it all happened at once. If it was gradual, it's not very likely that it would be seen as a, a flood in the sense of any of the flood myths. But anyway, that, it's a logical possibility, and I think the most likely to be true that they were drawn from the same source, even just a, a, an oral tradition that was around before things were written down. They could have taken from another story that was well known in both areas. But anyway, uh, those are our possibilities. You can't necessarily know which one is true, but the author thinks that he does, and he's going to try to prove that uh, his is true, even though it's the least likely. So let's see what he has to say. Now, in the uh, introduction to this chapter, he's he wants to establish that the flood myth is absolutely true because it's part of God's word, and God's word is perfect. How do we know that? Because God's word says so. Yes, of course. Before he even gets to the first paragraph in this chapter, he's begging the question. I'm tired of it. You're tired of it. I, I'm just going to skip right on to... The issue, this is where he brings up the content of this chapter. He mentions the Epic of Gilgamesh, which is probably new information to a lot of Christians. And I didn't even know a lot of this myself, so it was interesting to read. And we, we found uh, the, these uh, buried cities in the ancient Near East where excavations uncovered a whole library of tablets from earlier Mesopotamian times. On the 11th tablet was a narrative about the Great Flood, part of the Gilgamesh epic. And so atheists, after this discovery, believe that uh, the flood myth was stolen from this Gilgamesh epic. Now he says uh, in this section called the fallible, the fallible versus the infallible, says, only two conclusions can come from a study evaluating if the Bible is a derivation from ancient mythology. Number one, if this is true, biblical claims of God's inspiration and his perfect word are untrue and the Bible cannot be trusted. Number two, the Bible truly is the word of God and any other claim of authorship or external influence is false. I, I see that as a false dilemma. I believe that some of the Bible is true. Uh, Books like Nehemiah, for instance, I'm almost certain Ezra and Nehemiah, these things that are just about construction of the temple, I'm pretty sure those are true. They're all based in fact. There's no miracle claims. There's no uh, bias of trying to build God up. They seem to be just historical documents. There's no reason to dismiss absolutely everything in the Bible as untrue just because some of it is. That's. I think that's the, the inspiration for why Christians have to believe that it is all true, that it is fundamentally true, that it is perfect to its every word, because if if they couldn't, they just wouldn't know how to sift through what's true and what's not. They don't have any foundation, no epistemology for discovering how we know anything. And so he, he kind of gets depressed about this, like, man, if it turns out this is derived from ancient myth, how do we know any of the Bible is true? I, I would say learn how to know. A lot of us have done that. So we go on to the significance of the find, the dating and source dependence of the documents. Uh, here he says the supposed dating of the tablets found range from 2200 to 620 BC. 
God gave the law to Moses during the wilderness wandering in the 15th century BC. It's kind of funny the the biased wording here. Supposedly these tablets were found to be older, but God gave the law to Moses in 15th BC. Not supposedly. He he knows this for a fact. And so allegedly these Sumerian records are older. He, he uses the word supposedly, allegedly. And I, I was expecting after he keeps trying to cast doubt on the dating that in some place here in this chapter, he would try to make a case for not being as old as archaeologists claim. But he doesn't do that. So I would say that all the evidence still shows that the Sumerian records are older and he hasn't even tried to persuade us that that's not true. Three possible reasons exist for the consistencies between these documents and the Bible, explaining the correlation. Number one, these Sumerian documents were derived from the original Hebrew text, but are skewed and inaccurate. It's the but that they are skewed and inaccurate are, are in parentheses, like he just wanted to throw his own little bias in there so that you couldn't even possibly think that they are derived from the Hebrew text which was skewed and inaccurate, and the Sumerian documents were true. It's a possibility. He doesn't present it as one. Number two, the Hebrew text was derived from these documents, again, parathetical, but was corrected in the process. Or number three, both are separate accounts of commonly known history. He says one cannot make a definitive choice between the first and third options. Sure, you can evaluate the evidence. But the second option requires an irrational leap. That's the one that atheists believe. Why? When historical accounts are passed down, unless great t care is taken to avoid it, such as has been taken with the biblical record, again, assumptions, the records are usually embellished as time goes on, so the history becomes more and more distorted. The second option would require the writer to weed through numerous embellished and legendary accounts to produce the inspired records. Some might claim that God directed Moses through the process, but the author would need to sift through scores of text in multiple languages just to find the scraps of inspired material in each. For some reason, he assumes that if the Hebrews stole this, this flood account, that they had to have done it by digging up these tablets themselves and putting together the story. Instead of this just being a, a story that had already been written down and retold and they just got it as perhaps a complete account that we just haven't recovered yet, or as oral tradition. He, he doesn't seem to assume that this is even possible, even though it's more likely. Uh, so I, I don't even know what to say about that. This is so rational. Uh, he goes on to talk about the pre-flood kings, and I, I really just don't care much for this. He, he's just listing the similarities and differences in them and going on to say that he finds the biblical account to be uh, superior. He, he believes that because there are more details in the flood, the Noah's flood myth, that it's truer. I, I don't understand. It's a non sequitur. But I, I like this next section. Let, let's uh, go on to the differences in the detail. Uh, so he, he talks about the, the differences between these two and why the flood myth makes more sense and the Epic of Gilgamesh doesn't. Now, don't take me wrong. I don't believe that the Epic of Gilgamesh is true. I believe that it's mythical as well. Just because the Noah's flood myth makes more sense, if it does, than something else that's also not true, doesn't make the, the flood myth true. It, it doesn't even necessarily make it truer. It just means it, it's more scientifically accurate. But let's, let's see what he has to say about the differences in the details. The Bible specifically states that Noah took two of every kind of land-dwelling animal and seven of some animals onto the ark. The Genesis is clear and realistic when comparing the animals and the size of the ark. Now, scientists have already gone on to say no, it's it's not. There are way too many species on Earth. There's no way that they could fit into the flood, into the ark. And people who believe in this uh, ark myth don't even take it, things into account like uh, food. I mean, for instance, the amount of food that everything on Earth would need to consume 
in seven months of floating around on the water, which it, uh, apparent, according to the story, Noah doesn't even know how long the flood is going to last. So he's taking on an unknown amount of food for all this time. So perhaps more than seven months worth of food. And it, there's just no accounting from uh, these fundamentalists on how there's space to that. As well as things like uh, feces, their, their crap. How do you get rid of that? Where's the space for that? Just moving around space. A lot of things will die if you don't give them space to roam. Just things like that. There's not enough space. There's not even enough space to fit every animal on the ark. They have to make claims like they were all babies when they went on as if every species takes more than seven months to grow up. The Gilgamesh epic is an unreliable account because it states Utnapishtim was to take the seed of all living creatures, both wild and tame, that he had available. This leaves us with no information about how many animals were likely on board the boat or whether all the necessary kinds would have been represented for repopulation. Now note, even though he says there's enough space for all the animals in the Noah's Ark account, the Gilgamesh epic takes on all the seed, which clearly there's space for, and he makes no mention of this. But, I, I mean, that seems a little more realistic, a little more possible. His argument is that that leaves us no information on how many animals are taken. Well, we don't really have a count of how many animals went on to Noah's Ark either. You would have to know how many species, how many kinds of animals there are on the earth before you could even make that calculation. Uh, it says the biblical dimensions of the Ark were detailed and consistent with a vessel that could float in rough waters and could house the animals described. The dimensions of the boat in the Gilgamesh epic amount to more of a cube-shaped vessel with the beam equaling the length. Although it, we know it had seven stories, it is impossible to determine the full size of the vessel. Logistically, this boat could not float in a stable manner in rough seas and would not be structurally reliable. I agree. And if you have seen Ken Ham's uh, argument against Bill Nye earlier this year, you'll know that Bill Nye made the same argument about Noah's Ark. If it were as long as it was and wide, uh, especially being made of wood, it would twist and break in the, the waves. You can't make a, a ship of that size, of those dimensions, out of wood. I don't know if that's true or not. I, I didn't bother to, to look up at anything that Bill Nye there said, because I didn't really think it was that important. But still, I, I think it's ironic that it, he makes that argument. I, I love this next one. I'm going to expand on this a lot. The Bible is consistent, re, consistently reliable on the account of the birds that were released. It is logical to send out a raven before a dub, given that ravens are scavengers, while doves feed only on plants. And he, he compares it to the Gilgamesh epic, which mentions a dove, then a swallow, and finally a raven. I would go out on a limb here and say that Steve Ham would be arguing that it makes more sense to send out a dove first if that's what the, the Bible account said because he didn't reason this over, he didn't think about it a lot and then come to the conclusion, oh the Bible happens to agree with me. He took what the Bible said and then tried to rationalize it. How do I know that? Because both accounts are so incredibly stupid. Now he says, it's logical to send out a raven before a dove, given that ravens are scavengers. Scavenge on what? Uh, according to the, the Noah's Ark story, everything on earth is dead unless it's on the ark. What is a raven going to find? It's illogical to send it out in any case. And I would argue that it's kind of illogical to send out the dove too, because even though it supposedly finds a branch in the story, it wouldn't, realistically. Even if there were some land, we don't expect anything to be growing there. Anything uh, that that would have seeds in it, for instance, would have been uh, soaked by salt water for months and months, and under miles and miles of water. There's no way that any plant life survived. There's no way that any seed would be able to grow after that. There's no reason to expect the earth still have vegetation afterwards, especially something flowering and blossoming that a dove could find and bring back evidence of. 
there's just not enough time. Uh, how how long does he think dry land has been uh, uh, somewhere on the Earth before uh, he actually crashes on it? It's it's just so silly. Now, atheists have pointed out that both of these birds being sent out, it's kind of dumb when supposedly Noah could just cut out the middleman and talk to God. Aren't they still on speaking terms? Why send out these birds to find these things, whether uh, when you could just say, hey, God, is it time yet? Is there dry land? Get a quick answer, and you'd know it would be logically infallible because it's from God, right? Even Christians agree with this one, but for some reason he doesn't. He goes to natural causes, which is dumb because not only is the raven not going to find anything, but even when the dove brings back a branch, how do we know that it's from a tree? A lot of trees were destroyed in the flood. Isn't it reasonable to believe that olive branches have just been floating on the water all this time? Now I would say I would say probably the same thing you do. No, it's it's not logical to believe that because they would have been washed under the waves. They're not going to be floating around all this time. But Christians have to account for the fact that bugs were not on the ark. Uh, none of the none of the insects were taken. Where are they all this time? Well, they come up with all these ideas like maybe they're floating around on pieces of wood and debris. Well, if that's the case, then debris has to be able to float around for seven months. And thus, something like an olive branch could plausibly be sitting on top of the water for a dove to collect. When he comes back with it, it doesn't mean that there's a tree growing anywhere. And even further than this, even if he asked God, is there any dry land? There's no reason to ask because he can't do anything with this information. Ken Ham should know this because he reconstructed the art to make his creation museum. Ken Ham, Steve Ham, all of you guys, what what do you expect Noah to do with this information? The art doesn't have a rudder. It doesn't have a motor. It doesn't have any sails. There's no steering mechanism of any kind. If Noah saw land, 50 miles that way, and he, he could see it, and he's like, oh, there's land right there. That's all he can do with that information. He can watch it as he drifts on by because he's at the mercy of the waves. He he can't do anything with the, the this knowledge of land. So I think the the whole idea of sending out ravens and doves, and all, that's just stupid. That shouldn't have belonged in the story. It was just scientifically stupid. It's logically stupid. Stupid Christians. All right. So he goes on to the character of the gods listed in both epics. We'll skip this. We don't care about the character of the gods. We really don't. So in conclusion, of course, he finds that the Genesis flood account gives enough credible information to allow for historical and geological confirmation, which we know to not be true. Uh, everything that we find in geology always seems to go against this idea that uh, the, the, any any worldwide flood of any sort could have happened. Uh, I'm not going to delve into it because this chapter doesn't either, and that's a topic that I know you and I could both go on about for a long, long time. So anyway, in, in summation, he finds that the flood account must be true because it is truer than the epic of Gilgamesh, which has a lot of flaws. Good for you, Steve Ham, for being able to find that this myth has flaws. And how sad for you that you can't see the flaws in your own myth. So anyway, that is all for Chapter 5. That is all I have to say. I am tired of it. And uh, in the next video, we'll, we'll go on to Chapter 6. Is the Trinity three different gods? You probably really don't care about the answer. I don't either. But still, we'll explore it together. Maybe we'll come up with something interesting to say about it. Until next time, peace.